I'm going to ask you just for a moment to lift up your hands. As you worship for another two minutes, maybe three minutes, I'm really going to urge you on to press in, to make your heart's desires known to God. The Word of God declares that those who come to God but believe that He is, and He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Jesus, we declare that there's no other name like your name. As the music just plays on, I, I'm going to urge you on to make your heart's desires known to God. See, anything can happen in the presence of God. I see our families are being mended together. Marriages getting healed today. That rebellion child of yours is coming back to God today. I see our businesses flip on this side now. I see our relationships getting restored in this place. I see our broken hearts are being restored. See our bodies being healed. 
If you have pain in your body right now, anywhere in your body right now, I want you to lift up your hands quickly. If you have pain in your body right now, if you have pain in your body, from back pain, if you have pain in your body right now, I want you to lift up your hands. And I want someone that don't have pain in his body just to lay his hands on your shoulder quickly. To leave your seats. Don't worry, this is the English service. Anything can happen. Man lays hand on a man, a lady lays his hand on a lady. Just there we are. There we are. We believe that God still heals as we speak. We still believe that God sets people free as we speak. God has not changed. Our perception of Him changed. But God is still the healer. He's still the one that sets us free. His name is still above your sickness, above your pain. And Father, as we come as a people, We declare now that all pain to leave the body now in Jesus' name. I declare that the spirit of infirmity will leave every person now in Jesus' name. And I pray for the spirit of freedom to come into that body now in Jesus' name. Father, I pray that you'll come in your, in your fullness, Father, and you'll, Father, you say that you're consuming fire. And Father, I pray that you will come and consume all drops of pain, everything to come and land now with the Word of God. And the Word of God declares that we are free, and the one who God has set free, we will be free indeed. And Father, now all pain to leave their bodies now, in Jesus' name. Father, we pray for the glory of God to come into this place. Father, we repent today and say that, God, we say that you only did miracles in that day. Father, but you still do miracles today. Nothing about your word has changed. Nothing about your nature has changed. Father, you're still the one that's doing miracles. You're still the one. Just take your eyes off a man. A man can't do anything for you. It's only God. It's only Jesus. It's only the Spirit of God. No man has given his life to you. No man has bore the cross for you. And Father, who declares by every stripe, we are healed. And Father, you were bruised for our iniquity. And Father, now we claim and we put a demand on heaven for our healing now. Father, we put a demand on heaven. Father, your word says whatever we loose in heaven will be loose on earth. And Father, today we loosen every, every person that is bound. Father, we loose them now in Jesus' name. And Father, healing to come into their bodies right now in Jesus' name. Spirit of the living God. May this not be a service like any other. May we have an encounter with you. May we have an encounter with you, Jesus. I see how people are getting free from back pain. It's in the middle of your back. Everything to come in line. Everything is straightening now. I see how arms and legs and the bones is coming in line with the Word of God. Father, you set them free. In Jesus' name. Father, we refuse, we refuse to have church the same as what we did a hundred years ago. Thank you for healing to come into their bodies now. In Jesus' name. In the mighty name of Jesus. We declare that the name of Jesus is still above every other name. Your sickness.
Can I just ask if God has touched you this morning? I want you to raise your hand if God has healed you. I want you to raise your hand. And church, let's give them a hand. It is not about a man. It is not about a man. Amen. Amen. Let's give Jesus a hand. Come on, church. Come on, come on, come on. Amen. God is good. All the time. God is good. I really hope you didn't come for a man. No man can do what God can do. We do the natural. God is doing the supernatural. There was a man that asked me one time on the radio station. He asked me, so how is it possible? Do you really believe that God still do miracles? And what I asked him was, how can you separate a supernatural God from supernatural wonders? Who said God stopped doing miracles? Who made the decision? I want to tell you, God is still the same today, yesterday, and forever. His nature is the supernatural. It means if you can explain it, it's probably not God. If you can explain it, it's not God. Because God is working in the supernatural. You get all the stupid scientists that try to convince us that you're from a monkey. But I want to tell you, you're from birth out of the, out of the mouth of God. There's none like you. Be holy for God is holy. Be one in your, in your creation as God is one in His own nature. Amen? Don't let anybody ever tell you that God does not move anymore. Don't let anybody try to convince you. Because some of us have tried all man-made solutions. Let's give God a chance. I want to share a small testimony. There was a time, I remember it as yesterday. There was a time, I was lying in my flat in Littleton Centurion. Everything going for me, except this one thing. I was looking for something bigger than me. Because church convinced me that God has lost His power. And I remember lying on my bed three or four o'clock in the morning. And I said, is there, if there's a God out there, I want to experience you. But if you're not there, I don't want to live anymore. And I remember how God came into that room because there's something when your heart cries out to God that God will show himself to you. I was done with all the man-made things another party, another this, another that, until you experience the fullness of God, the nature of God. And this morning, wherever you are, I want to tell you that God is not done with your story. God is not done with your marriage. God is not done with your children. God is not done with your business. God is not done with you. For whoever cries out to God, God will never disappoint you. But here's the thing in in Jeremiah 29, it says, but if you seek me with all your heart, you will be found by me. It means that if you start looking for him, all of a sudden he says, here I am. And God is faithful. And if you believe it this morning, I want you to give God the best hand of your life. Make a joyful noise.
Amen. God is good. Come on, come on. We can take our seat. Before you take your seat, just greet someone that you haven't greeted before. Just tell them, welcome to the house of God. And then you give them a footnote and says, anything that can, anything can happen in the house of God. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, okay, so uh, we were just praying for healing and everything else like that. And those of you that know me know that three weeks ago, I tore my bicep. I tore it off. And uh, <laughs> we don't have medical aid, and we're okay with that. We trust God. And, but we were like, well, it is what it is. It's off, and it's off, and it's Okay. But we trusted God. We are, I truly trusted God that he was going to come and heal it. And for two and a half weeks, it's nearly three weeks because tomorrow it will actually be three weeks. Nothing's happened. It's been sore and it's, it's just become a pain that I've become accustomed to in the last three weeks. And we were praying now and uh, something just said, check your arm. And I checked my arm and it's good. <laughs> Say your God is good. <laughs> Amen. Wow. Man, God is still doing miracles, man. <laughs> Those who know you know that that is, no man can do it for him. I remember a Friday morning we were ministering in a, in a business in Middleburg, and there was a lady that uh, yes, was standing at the back of her, and she, <laughs> and, and she was just slain in the spirit, and all of a sudden he had to catch her, but that was a weird moment. I'm not going to lie to you because his arm, there's no power. But God is faithful. God is true. Man, I refuse to be, have church the same way. If you don't come expecting to church for God to move, why are you coming? Really, this is a good question. Just let's stay in your house and have a bride. Have a bride already. But when you come to church, there needs to be expectation for God to move. Every single time I come onto the stage, there's expectancy for God to move because I know that God moves in expectation. Faith, faith says God can do it. Expectation says God can do it for me. I'm expecting God to move. Amen. So can I just ask, who's here for the very first time? <laughs> Maybe you should have asked this before. So who's here for the very first? You can just raise your hands if you're here for the very first. Let's just give them a great hand. Come on, church. It's so good to have you guys with us. We know that you, there's so many churches you can go and visit, but you decided to be here this morning. Um, I just want to say, we're going to we ask you to stay for five because every single service looks different than the other one. Even the first service looked different than this one. So we ask you to stay for five because every service is intentionally different than the other one. Because maybe you walked into this place and say, oh, yeah, I didn't come for this. It's all funny business to me. And we understand. That's why we ask you, stay for five. Because maybe on the fifth service, God just drops something into your heart. Amen. That is good. That is good. So this morning, uh, let's just give God, um, honor God with our finances. If you're here for the first time, we are going to ask you not to give anything. Uh, in this church, we believe that you give out of obedience. So in this church, we give what God tells us to give. Because every time God asks you to do something, he's got a harvest for your mind. Uh, God says your obedience is better than any sacrifice. Sometimes sacrifice looks like obedience. Remember when God asked us to give a, a car the first time, he said, God, I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> but I do want to tell you that God has got a harvest for your mind. Whatever God asks you to give, he's got a harvest for your mind. We don't like the process. We only like the outcome. That's why God gave his son, because he saw the outcome of his seed. If you don't understand that Jesus was a seed, the firstborn, the prototype, or the Greek word is the protokos on the cross for everybody to follow. God gave his base so that he knows that every one of us will have part in that. So this morning, I'm going to ask you to take out your seed. Take out your seed. Let's honor God. 
with us. I want you to lift it up to the sky. Father, in this moment, as we give this morning, Father, as you come and rain over every seed, Father, may we have a harvest, 30, 60, and 100 fold. Father, we claim it. Father, because your word in Malachi says, test me if I will not open the heavens for you. Father, this morning, we test you in this moment. And Father, we ask that you will give bread to the one who needs to eat and seed to the one who needs to sow. And we honor you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. There's also a card machine at the back if you want to give it via a card machine. There's a zapper code that you can use for all the young people. Father, thank you for everybody that sowed this morning. Father, may we expect a harvest. Father, no farmer ever sowed a seed without expecting something back. And Father, even though it's not the main reason why we give, Father, but we can't help ourselves to give with the expectation. Father, we honor you. We declare there's none like you. Jesus, we just love you. Amen and amen. So this morning, we're going to talk about overcoming or a giant slaves. And we're going to talk about a story that is very well known in the, in the Bible. If you've been to church maybe twice, maybe just once, you would have known the story. So this morning, we're going to talk about overcoming and the keys to overcome in your life. So I think when I look outside the church, sometimes inside the church, I see that some of us can do with a little bit of winning. Some of us can do with a little bit of changing of uh, outcomes. Hello. You guys excited to be here? Yeah. You've overcome so many things, you need to be excited about the Word of God. How do I know that? Because have you ever seen a person, if he gave your child something, let's say a hundred bucks. My daughter's in the, in, in the church, so when I give her a hundred bucks and she's like, ah. How do you think the next hundred bucks will look like? Not for her. Because we need to be excited about the word of God. Because if we can get uh, uh, this to our, to our hearts and say that God's word's got potential to change outcomes. God's words is bringing your future into your present. That's why preaching the word of God is so necess uh, necessary. Because God's actually saying that I'm going to bring your future. Your future says that it looks better than what you experience now. And God says I'm going to bring your future into your present. That's why preaching is supernatural. Hello. Preaching the word of God is supernatural. Because God can change your outcome in this moment. That's why we're excited about the Word of God. Because when the Word of God says, hey, listen here, if you sow today, you can reap tomorrow. It means that God is bringing your future into your present. It means that you don't have to suffer in silence. You don't have to suffer. And so I want to tell you that some of us can do with a little bit of winning. Yes, yeah, some of us need a little bit of winning in our life because after lockdown and during lockdown, before lockdown, everything was just a big fat L. Hello, I'm trying to be hip for all the young people, but you don't, uh, I don't even know what that means. I'm, I'm going to just be honest with you. I don't even know what that means, a big fat L. I see the young people are here, so I'm trying to be, uh. but some of us ex need to experience a little bit of a big fat W. Of a dub. Uh, that's what a, a dub. And that's the end of it. I promise you. No more. No more. No more. <laughs> that's it. So when you look at the, uh, in, in the Bible, one of, I think one of the well-known stories is the, 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 the story of, of uh, 
David and Goliath, I think there's not a, a, a better story to really show what the victory on the cross should look like and did look like, but was a mirror image in the Old Testament. So sometimes when I look at the story of David and Goliath, I can see that Christ did, and he, and he went through the same things. So there's not a better story for me to really try to convince you that we all need a little bit of winning in our life. And the thing is this, if I step back from the story of David and Goliath, when I look back, I can see there were certain steps that was followed, and that actually gave him the, can you all help me? Dub. Okay, sorry for all the young, new people. We don't do this every single time. I don't even know what I'm saying. So here's the thing. So I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start off and, and I'm going to ask you, even though it's a well-known story, I'm going to ask you to open up your heart. For what is about to follow, I really believe that God wants to deposit something in your life. Certain keys that we can follow to change the outcomes of whatever we're facing. For everybody that's making notes, some of us can be in a, in a, in a war but not be part of the war. Um, some of us can be going through things but never ever experience the outcome of victory. Some of us is going through the same things for the past 20, 20 or 30 years but never ever experience the winning side of life. And this morning I'm going to f- uh, share a few keys, and I'm not going to be long, but I'm going to share a few keys to help you to win at life. Because Jesus made a a statement. He says, I have come to give you life in abundance. What does abundance look like to you? What does it look like to really walk in abundance? Because what I found about uh, things about abundance is you can have abundance of money, but no health, and your money means nothing to you. So when Jesus said, I want you to experience life in abundance, it's not just life in your finances, it's life in every area of your life. What does it matter if you have all the money, but you're, you're so sad you can't even get out of your bed? You're so depressed that you can't even get out of your bed. What, what does it help you to, 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 to be married, but never experience the fullness of your marriage, or never experience love in your marriage? What does it matter if you've got everything going for you, except you don't have Christ? Why does it profit a man if he have conquered the whole world but never experienced Christ's love? So this morning, I want to ask you, we all can do with a little bit of winning. And so when I look back, the story of David and Goliath, there were certain steps that David followed, and that gave him the win. Maybe this morning, some keys will, will drop into your heart, and things will change from this moment. So I want to ask you to look at your neighbor. Maybe it's your wife, maybe it's your husband. I understand. But I'm going to ask you to look at them and tell them, hey, hey, you giant slayer, you. I can see there's a giant slayer inside of you. I can see that something is different about you. Hello. Some of us don't see anything. You're just experiencing, you're just prophesying over him. You look better now. You look better now. You look better now. You look better now. (laughs) Don't worry. Your husband look at you and say, you look younger now. You look younger now. (laughs) Now I'm joking. Uh, Here's the thing. So we need to understand. Now I'm joking. Don't worry. So the story in 1 Samuel 17, 7 says, One day Jesse sent to his son David, Take this basket of cooked grain and these ten loaves of bread to your brothers in camp. He's sending out with a mission. I want to tell you, in this moment, when he sent his son David, David was already anointed as king, but never appointed as king. So David was anointed. He was the next king of Israel. So his father is sending him with something. He's sending him with a a message. Also take these 10 pieces of cheese for the officer who commands your brothers, group of uh, 1,000 soldiers. See how your brothers are doing. Bring back something to show me your brothers are all right. It's very important for us as we make notes. His father is asking, bring us something back to show me that your brothers are all right. So if you're making notes this morning, I want you to underline that. Bring something back to show me your brothers are all right. I'm, I'm going to read the story, but I'm, I'm going to try to be quick. Early in the morning, David and another shepherd take care of the sheep while he took the food and left as Jesse had told him. David drove the wagon... <laughs> Back into the camp, the soldiers, were, the soldiers 
were going out to battle uh, position just as David arrived. The soldiers began shouting their war cry. Very important for us this morning. They were busy shouting their war cry, psyching themselves up. Then the, the Israelites and Philistines were lined up ready for battle. I love this. Ready for battle. David left the, fl- uh, the food with the uh, man who kept the supplies. Then he ran to the place where the Israelite soldiers were and asked about his brothers. Brothers, how, is my brother doing okay? Whatever, whatever. David, uh, while David was talking with his brothers, the Philistines' champion father came out from the Philistines' army. This was Goliath. Goliath means to reveal. They, uh, Goliath name means to reveal. And it's not part of the sermon this morning, but I just want to tell you, uh, sometimes we're facing giants to reveal what is God, what God has placed inside of you. So whenever you're facing a giant, maybe it's God's way of telling you, this is who I am going to be through you and in you. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Okay. While David was talking to you, um, David left the food with the man. Gives the fly. Okay. While David was talking uh, with his brothers, the Philistine champion father came out from the Philistine's army. This was Goliath, the Philistine from Gath. Goliath shouted things against Israel as usual. David heard what he said. So here's the champion fighter, the Goliath, the champion, and he's shouting things to the Israelites. One of the things he said, whoever wins this battle today, the other team will be the slaves of us. It's a good story if you look at the cross. Because Jesus, the champion fighter of heaven, made a statement and says, from this moment on, if I conquer death, you will never ever be a slave to death. If you are fighting for us, if you are in God's camp, I want to tell you that death is not the end result. You you can conquer death because Jesus has conquered death. Amen. So uh, David did what he said. The Israelites saw this, uh, saw with Goliath and ran away, and they, and they all were afraid of him. <laughs> so he's saying, "Okay, guys, we're gonna we're gonna sort everything out today." The moment he said that, all of them ran away. And I think to myself, when David was still a young boy, now he's looking every, he's he's watching on how this thing unplays in front of him. Uh, one of the Israelite men said, "Do you see that man?" <laughs> Look at him. He comes out of uh, out each day and makes fun of Israel. Whoever kills him will get rich. So important for the story this morning. Whoever kills this man will get rich. King Saul will give him a lot of money. Saul will also let his daughter marry the man who kills Goliath. And if you follow the story, David is lining himself up to be the next king. David is lining himself up because, remember, um, if 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 Saul is the king and I marry the daughter, there's a good chance I can become king. I'm positioning myself for victory. I'm positioning myself for what God has called me. He also made the man's family free from taxes in Israel. David asked the men standing near, what did he say? I love this. I love how David just said, what did he say? I just want to make sure. Is this what he said? What is the reward for killing this Philistine and taking away the shame from Israel? Who is this Goliath anyway? I love it. He's he's only some foreigner, nothing but a Philistine. Why does he think he can speak against the army of the living God? So the Israelites told David about the reward for killing David, uh, for killing Goliath. David's oldest brother, Eliab, heard what David was talking with the soldiers and became angry. Eliab asked David, why did you come here? Who Who do you leave those few sheep with in the desert? I know why you came down here. Uh, you didn't want to, uh, want to do what you were told to do. You just wanted to come down here to watch the battle. David said, <laughs> what did I do now? I didn't do anything wrong. I was only talking. He turned to some other people and asked him the same question. He gave them the same answer. The third time, David asked, just tell me again. I want to know, what is the result or what is the reward for this man or a man killing this giant? Some men heard David talking, they took David to Saul and told him what David had said. Um, David said to Saul, people uh, shouldn't let Goliath discourage them. I am your servant. I will go and fight this Philistine. That's what I love about David. Never back down from a fight. 
And this morning, I want to tell you, some of us can be part of the, the war, but not in the war. Some of us are sitting here. You've been fighting the same battle because you didn't fight it. You were just part of the battle. Never part of taking up arms. Isn't it weird that his brother sat there and said, why did you come here? Why are you here? Because his brother thought he was busy with the war. But he wasn't. Some of us, God has called you so many years ago. Some of us, has got this word and a passion for the, for the things of God. God has called you. You're part of this. Listen, some of us sitting in the same marriage, God has asked you to fight for her, fight for him, fight for your children, fight for your business, fight for. And you say to yourself, I'm part of this thing. I'm just going to. I'm just going to take it lying down. We never say that, but we experience it every single day. You show up for war, but never being part of the war. You show up, but you're never part of the war. And even though it's not part of the point that I want to make, I want to tell you some of us has been fighting this war. And I say fighting, you showed up for war. But God is calling you to stand up. God is calling you to be a champion fighter. God has called you to be a giant slayer. But because you got used to lying there and think that you're part of the war, nothing has changed. Nothing has changed in the last 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. So the qualities of a giant slayer, I'm going to run through this quickly. Giant slayers are submissive. And this, what are you saying? I want to tell you the first point. If you want to know if you're a giant slayer, the first point is David was already appointed or anointed as king. So he should have actually said to his father, listen, father, I am the next king. Send the other guy to go. Send the other guy to go. Don't you know that who I am? Don't you know who I am? I am the next king. But he said, I'm going to follow instructions. Some of us don't experience freedom in our life because we can never submit to anybody else. And even though we are all men and even though we are all uh, part of God's kingdom, there's certain things that we need to understand. God said you need to be submissive to the authority that was placed over you. You need to be submissive to the government that was placed over you. Because you need to come under what God has placed over you. You need to get under what God has placed over you. Or you will never move over what God wants, you, wants to be under you. Unless, but aren't you just playing with words? I want to give you an example. Where Jesus was walking, he took the highest authority in that time, which was John the Baptist. So he said to John the Baptist, John the Baptist, you need to baptize me. What did John say? I'm not worthy even tie your shoes. I'm not worthy. Jesus, please don't let me do this. I'm not worthy. What does Jesus respond? This is the will of the Father. Jesus was saying, I'm a man of authority under authority. I can only lead, I can only go, uh, because if you really want to know if you're submissive, just check if you don't have to be. If you really want to know if you're obedient or that you can be submissive, just check when people, the, the best way is to hear the word no. Whenever you hear no and you can still submit, then you know you've done it. I've seen so many people that come to me and say, Pastor, uh, God has given me this word. God has given me this and God has given me that. And then I said, no, this is not the church for me. I'm out uh, because... Uh, if, God was trusting you. God was checking you. God was actually uh, testing you to say, can you really submit? Because if you really want to grow big, you need to be under someone. Hello. In the land of honor, there will always be multiplication. Isn't it weird that the only, the only commandment in the Bible that has got a, a promise to it is honor your father and your mother and it will be, God will add years to your life. What is he actually saying? If you can submit under them, but they are not godly, they are not this, they are not that. God says, if you can submit under them, I can multiply in your land. One of the first keys 
But I really want to ask, maybe in your life, you're asking God, God, when will this happen? I've been working for the same guy for so many years. I'm asking you, are you honoring that guy that you're working for? Are you honoring them? Because for you to, for God to entrust you with your own, many times he will trust you with someone else's. David, David was called to lead this army after Saul. Can I ask you, if David moved out of submission in that time, do you think the people will listen to him afterwards? No, but so many times we think that it's, no, I, I've arrived. I'm the man with the talent. I'm the man with the power. I'm the man with this. Sub, uh, I want you to make a note for yourself quickly. Submission is not for the person above you. It's for yourself. If you really want to empower yourself, you know it's a good place to see that in marriage. If you see a husband and wife, I love this. Woman, wife, <laughs> you need to submit to your husband. And if you're really charismatic, you say to your own husband, I'm in for it. Yeah, because that's what we say. But just after the, in, in, in um, Ephesians 5, you read that when God says, wife, you need to submit to your own husband, and husbands, you need to do for your wife as Christ has done for the church. And you know what Christ has done for his church? He died for his church. It's actually a submission war in marriage. I want, I want to be the least, so that the moment I am the least, I can, be, I can lift you up even more. And the moment your wife is the least, she can lift you up more. And God is actually asking you, the first key to really have victory in your life, can you submit? Can you submit to the one that's over you so that God can entrust you with everything under you? First key. Romans 13 says, every person must submit to and support the authorities over them, for there can be no authority in the universe except by God's appointment. It means that everything that's above you is from God. Unders, but they're not godly. It is of God. Sometimes we need that ungodly person to show you what God is all about. Sometimes we need to go through things to show you really what God's nature is. So, to, yeah, God's appointment, which means that every authority that exists has been instituted by God. So to resist authority is to resist the divine order of God. And here's the thing, which results in se severe consequences. If you can't submit, God says there's going to be consequences. The next key, giant slayers are disciplined. Can I ask you? Sam, come here, please. Oh, you've got the camera. Come here. So, giant slayers are disciplined people. A discipline, a disciple means I've learned a discipline of the master. It's nothing more, it's nothing less. So many, oh, I'm a disciple of Jesus. How, how do you talk to people? How do you do business? Oh, I'm a, I'm a Jesus follower. I'm a Jesus disciple. I'm this, I'm that. A disciple means that I am following a master. So in Jesus' time, when the rabbi called his disciples, uh, all that I want you to do is, I want you to do and follow me as I follow Christ. So all that I want him to do is, I want him, whatever I do, he should do. That is a disciple. So when I walk here, and, and if I stretch out my hand, and if I walk here, and if I stop here and I say, people, I know it's funny this morning, but I want to really share a secret with you. Yeah, you must you must too.
when you follow Christ, <laughs> the idea was as follows, that the one that is following the rabbi, the competition between the disciples was as follows. Who can get the most dust at the end of the day on their clothes? Can I follow as close to my rabbi? <laughs> now you're thinking it's funny. Can, can I share you something with you? You'll find in the book of John, when there was a disciple that said he was always on the breast of Jesus. And the one, it's the only disciple that the Bible says, the one that Jesus loved. <laughs> he called himself that. But it wasn't that any of the other disciples ever questioned it because he was so, he was so close. So the idea about following Jesus is going to be so close to him that the dust of his feet at the end of the day should be on my clothes. That will be an indication that I have followed Christ so close. When he stopped, I stopped. When he spoke, I spoke. I want to be so close to him. That is true discipleship. So this question I'm going to, I'm just going to throw it out there. Who is following Christ? Because you follow Christ. Who's following Christ? Because you follow Christ. Paul says, Follow me as I follow Christ. To be a true disciple means the following. I follow him so close. Dads, I want to urge you guys on. Are you following Christ? So that your wife and your kids can follow Christ the way you follow him. Can your family follow Christ? As you follow him. What is that so far apart from me? I don't even know where to start. You can start today. You can start today to follow Christ so that everybody else can follow him. You can just stay right here. A disciple is the same in the darkness as in the light. I'm not following Christ just because on a, um, it's, it's Sunday. I don't follow Christ because Saturday is today, and I know tomorrow I need to repent again. Following Christ, to be a true disciple of Christ, means that I follow Christ. And, and I'm the same in the business, in church, and at my house. I am the same. That is a true disciple of Christ. Oh, you, don't know, you, you don't do business and, and be a Jesus follower. Says who? The devil. It's the only one to tell you that you cannot do business and follow Christ. It means that I am following him every single way, every single step. The next point. Early in the morning, oh, you're too short. Sorry. Lead. Please come here. Early in the morning, David and another shepherd take care of the sheep while they took the food and left as Jesse had told him to do. David drove the, uh, the wagon to the camp. The soldiers were go uh, going out to their battle positions just as David arrived. The soldiers began shouting their war cry. I want to tell you that giant, giant slaves always stand up. They always stand up. So how the battle field worked, can I ask you to stand right here? So how the battlefield worked was the following. So they used to grow a trench about two meters high for them to lie in and wait for the enemies to come. This is for protection. The problem with your hole that you dig is when the giant comes to you and I'm down here. Guess how big the giant looks. So many of us 
is so deep in a hole that everything that we look at is much bigger than what it is. And the moment the giant looks to be, guess what? My world becomes even smaller and smaller. And all of a sudden, and, and you know when this happens? It's in your worst time of your life. It's when you're facing the biggest obstacle. It's when your marriage is at its worst, the enemy tries to convince you, you'll never work again. When your kids are far from God, guess what? They will never serve God. When your finances is in a, in a state you can't, even, you can't even explain it, guess what? It will never change. Because what I found is, the moment you're in a hole, it's very difficult to get out. When you're down there, it's very difficult to stand up. Because everything looks bigger when you're down there. Every single thing in your life looks so much bigger when you're down in your hole. And the enemy always gets you down there. Isn't it weird that David said, even though his, his brother was in the hole, David came, stood next to the hole, and for the first time he could see the giant. Not from underneath, but he can see the giant, and he can bring it into perspective. What am I saying to you? I want to tell you this morning that the enemy will always try to convince you in your worst state in your life that there's no more hope, there's no more love, there's no more God, there's no more this, there's no more that. And I want to tell you, a giant slayer always stands up. Some of us need to stand up this morning and say, Andrews, I'm going to fight for my family. I'm going to fight for my children. I'm going to fight for my business. I'm going to fight for my life. I'm going to fight. We need to stand up and say, God, this is my moment. I've been in the battle, but never part of the battle. I've been lying in my hole. And everything looks bigger when I'm in my hole. Some of us need to stand up and see life. Because I want to tell you something, and just a, just a quick note. There's nothing that is in your life at, the, at this moment that you cannot overcome. Yes. There's nothing in your life at this moment that God cannot sort out for you. There's nothing in your life that God cannot change. And this, but the, the economy, now God is not working in this economy. I've seen it in my own life. God is not working in this economy. He's from above. He says, everything that is impossible for man, that's where I start to work. On this, but I, we just need to face reality. No, you need to face God. You need to face God face to face. Seek Him. On this, but I'm, just, I'm just honest with myself. No, you need to be honest with God. God can only get you at a place if you can. God can only touch you and God can only change your, your situation. If you can face where you are right now. And said, that's not the truth. God came to a blind man and said, what do you want me to do for you? I'm blind. No, God was looking, where's your heart at? Every single miracle that Jesus did, what do you want me to do for you? Stand up. It's a moment where God wants, wants you to, to see the world in the perspective what he, where he is at. Giant slayers always stands up. And if it's in your worst state where you are right now, and the lowest point of your life, praise God. Because there's only one way, and that's up. When you're in your lowest point of your life, sometimes it's good to see the only way from this moment is up. God never ever speaks into your situation. He always speaks to where you can be. That's why his word is always so, is God really saying that about me? Because God is always speaking to everything that you can be. Gideon, Gideon, you mighty man of valor. Oh no, Jesus, I'm the smallest of the small, the poorest of the poor. I'm the, and God said, I know. 
I know. Uh, David, David, but you know, I'm a shepherd boy. And God says, oh, you caught me off guard. I don't know that. God knows exactly where you are. And God speaks to you. Can I tell you, if God speaks something to your heart right now, God wants you to stand up and do something about your situation. Trust him in the next season. If God is speaking something, it's because God is saying to you, I know exactly where you are, and I can change it for you. Some of us need to stand up today. So, as you stand up, while you are down in the midst of your, you facing your biggest giant, how you stand up will determine um, if you have victory or defeat. If you're not going to stand up, you will not face victory. Honest, but that's a cruel thing to say. I know. But if you're really honest with yourself, you've been lying in that hole for a long time. God is asking you to stand up. In some of our cases, God is not even asking you to fight. He's just asking you to show up. He just wants you to show up. Number four, John Slayers. See challenges as training. You guys can sit. Thank you so much. Giant Slayer, see challenges as training. Every challenge is growth that is camouflaged. Every single thing that you go through, maybe it's a challenge today. What if I tell you it's the breeding ground for growth? Every single one of you that is working as we speak, your answer to a problem. <laughs> Everyone that's working today, your answer to a problem. Andres, but I'm selling staplers. I know. Your answer to many people's problems. I want to tell you today, don't see things as insignificant. God it's not done with you. Giant slayers can't keep quiet. Point number five. They can't keep quiet. Have you seen giant slayers? Whatever comes out of their mouth. They're always on this. Oh, I'm praising God. I'm praising myself out of the situation. Oh, I can't. David walks in. <laughs> David walks in in a moment where they're busy with their war cry. James is the following. He says, a fiery prayer of a righteous man. And I know exactly what it is. Availeth much. The other translation will accomplish much. It means don't keep quiet. If you want to see things that's going to change, you need to change what comes out of your mouth. Some of us need to worship ourselves out of our situations. <laughs> and we need to change what comes out of our mouth. Don't keep quiet. What are you trusting God for? What are you uh, uh, facing at this moment? That was perfect. I want to tell you that the enemy will try to keep you quiet. Point number six. Giant slayers are focused on the, pr uh, on the prize more than the risk. David said, just tell me again, the one that's slaying this giant, what will he get? And, and, and then his brother said, just keep quiet. And went to another guy and said, oh, just tell me, I just want to make sure. I don't want to defeat this giant, and there's no prize. I want to know, what does the person get? Because his focus wasn't on the giant. He wasn't saying, oh, look at this, that giant is really big. Because everybody else's uh, confession was, this giant is too big for us. You know what David said? What's the prize? Expectation for God to move. Expectation for God to slay this giant. Expectation for God. Or everybody else was, oh, this guy is too big. David saw the reward is going to be big. Giant slayers are more focused on the prize than the risk. What is the prize? I put this in, 
just for extra, just something extra. Um, there's something better than heaven. There's something that's worse than hell. When I, when I look at the prize, which is Christ Jesus, when I look at heaven, when I look at everything that's going, Paul, Paul makes a statement, he says, my eyes are fixed on the things that is above. I don't focus everything that's on earth because when I look at earth, I see corruption. I see all of these bad things. I see, see crime. I see, um, I see economies that fall. I see all of these bad things. I see um, pain and I see hurt and I see all of this. But Paul says, fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith. He says you need to focus on Jesus. Put your, put your eyes on the prize, which is Christ Jesus. Don't just follow here. Don't just, don't just think to yourself, oh, this is the end. Listen here, earth is not the end. Heaven is the end. So put your eyes on heaven, and that's why I say heaven, there's something that is better than heaven, and something so much worse than hell. If I look at my family today, if I look at my family, and I can't see them with me in heaven, when I look at my family and see one of them is going to hell, there's a burden in my heart to say, God, I'm not going to give up on them. There's something that sells me, God, you are the price, but I will not give up in this moment. Because there's something worse than hell. Here's the thing. If you see your family or friends with you in heaven, and you see them without you in hell. It means the fallen that if you're a giant slayer, you're going to stand up. Fathers, you're going to stand up and show your kids what it is to follow Christ. <laughs> Wives, you need to stand up and show your children what it is to follow Christ. We have an obligation for the next generation. Because if you really love them so much, why are you not telling them about Jesus? If you really love your neighbor so much, why are you keeping Jesus to yourself? If you really love them so, so much, why do you tell them, oh, they can choose what they want? No, they can't. Ah, oh, you know, uh, um, religion was forced on me. I'm not going to force anybody. No, you need to show them what it is to follow Christ. Don't force it to them, on them. Show them. Show them what it is to take to step the extra mile. Show them what it is to turn the other cheek. Show them what it is. To love your neighbor as you love yourself. Show them what it is to, to, to love other races. Show them what it is to live in a world that God has created. Show them. Don't force them. Don't just think church or Christ is just on a Sunday. No, show them what it is to follow Christ. Don't give them a choice. The choice is you follow. <laughs> Joshua made the statement. He says, you guys must choose today. But as for me and my house. As for me and my house, it means that in my household, no one's got a choice. We will follow Christ. We will follow God. No, but I want to go. No, no, no. If you're a part of my house, we're going to follow Christ. And we need to make a stand for Christ. To be a giant slave means that you're going to face a giant of rebellion, of witchcraft. You're going to face it. So we face it. We're going to follow Christ. Giant slayers are themselves. So here's David. We're almost done. So, so here's David on his way, and um, King Saul calls him in and says, listen, okay, I see you only got a kitty. That's it. Um, you can't fight a giant with a kitty. I can't say a slinger fell because none of us know what a slinger fell really looks like, but a kitty, we all know a kitty. So he says, a kitty, you can't face this giant with a kitty. I want you to put on the armor, and I want you to take my sword, and I want you to take my helmet. I want you to put everything on my armor. But I love what David said is, David says, I cannot fight with this because I'm not used to this. Don't let the enemy try to convince you that that which God has placed in your hand is insignificant. Don't let the enemy try to convince you that you are a giant slayer and what is in your hand, it's not capable for God to move something great or do something great. Maybe you are the weakest of the weak, but don't let the enemy try to convince you God's going to do anything through you. Oh, this is all that I have. God says, that's all that I want. 
Can you imagine the guy with the, uh, the fish and the bread, the young, the, the, the boy? Ah, uh, you know what? All that I have is two fish and five loaves of bread. God says, that's exactly what I want. Oh, uh, all that I have is a kitty. God says, that's all that I need. God, all that I am, I'm all alone, God. I'm already old. God says, that's all that I want to use. God, God all that I have against my name is a, a muddy and a, and a very bad divorce. God said, that's all I'm going to need. And God said, the only thing that I want is what is in your hand. Don't let the enemy try to convince you that that which is in your hand is insignificant for God to use. A giant slayer is always himself. I'm the same person. The next one, we're going to end off with this. Giant slayers are determined. I love this. When I read, and he took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones out of the brook for himself. And this is where the story really gets interesting. So, so, so David, and, and I know that the five stones means that the, the fivefold ministry in the New Testament, I'm in for it. And you will slay the giant with the fivefold ministry. I understand it. But when David took the five stones, he wasn't thinking about three and a half thousand years later, oh, I think there's going to be a time when the Bible ministry is going to rise up and they're going to stand up and we're going to, we're going to slay everybody and there's going to be prophets and they're going to be uh, evangelists and there's going to be a guy named Paul. And um, No, 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 he wasn't thinking. He took five stones from the brook. Which made me think, could it be that David said in himself, I know the most times, at the most extreme time, it never took me more than five stones to conquer anything. Could it be that David said, this giant will be the same as the bear and the lion that I faced in the field? And for some of the bears and some of the lions, it took more than one stone. Could it be that David said, I'm going to take these five stones. But today is the day that the giant's going to fall. If it's going to take me one stone and I miss him, I'm going to take another stone and another stone. I've got five tries. And it makes me think in our own story, how many of us have given up on the first stone? I wonder how many of us have given up on our children that is rebellious after the one stone. Ah, I've tried church. It didn't work for me. How many times did you go? Once. I, st- I tried that praying thing. It doesn't work. How many times did you pray? Did you fast? Or you just took one stone? It made me think that a giant slayer is a guy that's determined, whatever comes my way today, it will fall. If it takes me one stone... Maybe there's prayer and fasting. Maybe it's anointing him. Maybe it's asking him for the 502nd time. Come to church with me. But how many of us just said to ourselves, I've tried it. It's not for me. But you see, a giant slayer is determined. Even if I miss with the one stone, praise God there's four more. But this giant will fall today. Determined to see the outcome changed. I love it. There was a time, there was a time in my family where I had to keep quiet because I, I was so radically saved. I had an encounter with Jesus. And God says, you keep quiet because I know you can, you're going to, you got all of us So you keep quiet. <laughs> I will work with them. Because they asked me, so why are you not out? Why are you not drinking? Why are you not doing on drugs? Why are you not on drugs? Why are you not with women? Why are you not doing this? God says, you keep quiet. And slowly but surely, God was giving me a stone and another stone and another stone until a moment where I can face the giant that was tormenting our bloodline for so long of addiction. He said, no more. Shh. Conquering giants. I don't wanna I wanna I wanna give this to you and say maybe you have tried it five times. But be of good cheer. 
there's one more stone. Be of good cheer. God says, I am the stone. God says, if you really, if you really look for me, you will find me. God says, if you obey my words, you'll be like a wise man building his house on a stone. Listen, maybe it is what Jesus is telling you. If you hold on to me, there will always be another stone. Maybe you've tried it for so long. Don't give up. This is not the time to give up. The last point. I want everybody to stand. The last point is giant slayers always take authority over their enemies. Many of us don't know how the story with David and Goliath ended. Because many of us just see this, the picture with, with David threw him with a stone and it only took him one stone. And here's a giant falling to the ground. And that's more or less where most of our stories end. But this is not where David's story ends. The Bible says that David took the giant sword. And he walked up to the giant. And he cut his head off. As if to say, this giant will never ever rise again. This giant will never ever show his face in our future again. This giant is slain today. For some of us, you need to go back to your house. And prophetically, you're going to throw out all that garbage that you've been drinking and been ruining your families. And to say from this moment, Never again will this giant torment my family. Never again. But this is not where the story ends. The word says, after he chopped off his head, he took a spear. And this is a PG-13 moment. He took the spear, put it into the giant's head. And he took it back to his tent. Made me think. His father asked him, David, please bring us something back. <laughs> to show us that things are going to be all right. Come and show us. insignificant and every single time when David looked at the giant's head he said me and my hustle in my tent in my family I've slayed the giant in my family I've got the proof of it dad come let me show you they're going to be all right because God has not left us. Come, let me show you that God is still the one that brings victory to his children. I don't know what you're facing today. I really don't know. See, a head speaks of authority. David said it's not just good to chop it off, to kill it. But let this be a reminder to everybody that's following that this is the day that God has given your enemies into your hand. 
Some of us are making a statement today and say, this is the moment that God is coming into my story. And whoever comes after me will see the effect of me slaying giants today. So I'm going to make two invitations this morning. The first invitation, I'm going to ask you, if you want to accept Christ as your Lord and your Savior, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. If you're in this place and say, Andres, I don't know. I've been, I've been coming to church for a long time, but I don't know if there's a, there's a moment. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. It's, it is not about the church. It's not about a man. It's about a moment. I'm going to ask. If there's anybody in this place that say, Andres, I want to accept Christ as my Lord and my Savior. I don't ask if your father was the priest, the duomini, the priest. I'm asking you if you want to have an encounter with Christ. I want you to raise your hand. There's hands there at the back. Then I'm going to ask you to come to the front. Wait before you go. ask if there's anybody else that says, Andres, I want to do that. I want to accept Christ as my Lord and my Savior. I want you to raise your hand. Then the next invitation. I'm going to ask if there was something that was stirred in your heart that made you utter these words. God, I've been in the war, but not part of the war. I was there, but I never took up arms. This morning I heard that you have called me to be a giant slayer, and I've been fighting giants. Don't worry, I'm not going to ask you to come to the front, but I do want to ask you to give action to your words. If you're in this place and say, Andres, I want to be the giant slayer. For too long, the people around me have suffered. Because I'm, I was in the war, but never part of the war. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. If you're in this place, I don't, I'm not going to ask you to come to the front. All that I want you to do is give action to your faith. Put an action with it. This is my action. God, it's me. God can only come and touch you if you can recognize where you are. If you can recognize, God, I've been part of the army, but not, I, I, I've been part of the war, but really, God, I wasn't in the war. I want you to raise your hand. If this is you, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes for a moment. I'm going to pray a prayer over you. As your hands were in the air, I'm going to ask you to, to ask God, to God, come and use me where I am. In your own words, and then I'm going to pray over you. Ask God, God, come and use me where I am. Father, as every hand is in the air, and Father, every confession out of their mouths, Father, I said this will not be a service like any other service. Father, this is the day that you have called them. Father, that you have called them to be part of the war. Father, to take up arms and fight from this moment on. Father, there's no battle too big, no battle too small. Father, no giant too big that we cannot overcome. Father, I said you come in this moment and you work in people's hearts, in their minds, in their lives, Father. And Father, I know. That wherever your disciples went, Father, there was power and, Father, there was, uh, there was manifestations of your goodness and your favor with every person. Father, as we pick up arms this morning, Father, you will know that you have called us 
be part of this war. Father, I said you'll strengthen us. Strengthen us, Father. Father, I declare that nobody's lives will ever be the same from this moment on. In the mighty and the glorious name of Jesus Christ, come and use us for this movement. Come and use us for this time. Father, we refuse to let, us, let our families go to hell, Father. We refuse. Father, we will take up arms and we will fight for every single one of them. Father, we refuse for this, for this country to go to hell. Father, we will pick up arms. Father, we refuse, Father, to be, to be part of this problem. Father, we will take up arms and fight for this, for this town and fight for the city and fight for our region. In Jesus' name. Father, come and use us mightily. In the mighty name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Come on, let's give God a hand.